Hello everyone and welcome to this event about the value of strategic foresight hosted by Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. In a time of increasing uncertainty, the ability, the ability to navigate the future becomes increasingly important. Studies indicate that organizations with a structured approach to strategic foresight is overperforming the market. However, how to work with the future in a structured way is something that most organizations struggle with. And this is actually why we have invited three experts in the discipline of strategic foresight here with us today to discuss how to do this. My name is Lars Jonasson. I am director of advisory here at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And to those of you who don't know the Institute, we are a non-profit, independent futures think tank. Over the past 50 years, we have worked with the discipline of strategic foresight, providing value to individuals and organizations, helping them acting on the future today. So in this session, we will share insights on how corporates in different industries are working with the discipline of future studies. We have invited three phenomenal people here uh, with us today. We have Emilia Eidehag, Head of Corporate uh, Insight and Foresight at Telia. We have Olivier, Olivier Despier, Head of Foresight at AXA, and Thomas Bormans, Head of Foresight at E.ON. I have a lot of questions for you guys that I will love to go through throughout this uh, uh, event. Um, however, you audience out there, you're also very welcome to ask questions in the chat, um, come with comments. And my, my dear colleague, uh, Nabil, uh, he will um, try to, to help me uh, incorporate this in the discussion. So, introduction to, um, to the three of you. Emilia, would you start giving a, a short uh, introduction to who you are from a professional point of view? Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, well, my 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 education. If we start back there, uh, I have a master in business and marketing uh, with a focus on consumer behavior. So uh, I started off at Stockholm University, trying to understand why we consume the things uh, we do and what is motivating consumption, what makes us purchase what we do. And that is basically what I have been continuing to exploring for my for my full uh, career. So I spent uh, 15 years working with consumer insight in different uh, companies, uh, both at the research company, uh, innovation and branding company, and now currently at the telco and media company in the Nordics. Okay, great having you here, Emilia. Olivier, you. would you uh, give us a short introduction as well? For, for the invitation, so yes, I am on my side, I am economist uh, by learning. I uh, started my uh, career as a PhD candidate uh, doing applied research um, on the governance of innovation uh, within the French postal operator La Poste, because uh, there are a lot of innovation in the postal sectors. Um, uh, so it was during the early 2000s, trying to figure out how the postal operator um, was using the digital to innovate. I then joined the, the CNIL, so a very different uh, environment, uh, institutional environment. I joined the, the CNIL as a foresight and innovation uh, manager, where I co-founded the so-called digital lab. Uh, it was a kind of uh, internal platform for this institution to better understand the implication of emerging technologies on data and privacy. 
and it was at a very interesting time uh, during the GDPR negotiation. And now, for almost four years now, I've been uh, featuring uh, at AXA at the group level. Great having you here, Olivier. Thomas, would you give uh, an introduction as well? Yeah, happy, happy to do so. Um, also, thanks for the invite and uh, very nice group here. Looking forward to the talk. Uh, yeah, myself, uh, I'm an engineer, uh, so blo block-headed engineer from Germany. And um, then I worked for 16 years in consultancy, uh, always in the topic of energy efficiency, climate policies, uh, renewables. A lot in Brussels with um, associations, companies, the European Commission, and uh, made me a bit less uh, blockheaded. And then since six years, I'm now working with Aeon, and the last five years, um, yeah, I got the job there to start um, um, a structural function of foresight at that time in innovation. Uh, now that's part of strategy, and within the strategy uh, team, I'm heading the foresight activities. Okay, and maybe if we could continue with you, Thomas, could you uh, give us a, an overview of how you work with Foresight at Eon? Yeah, let's say um, the, the basic thing when we started uh, Foresight, the question was um, what, what we do it for. And I think that's, that's a very important thing if you do that at corporate level, that you need um, a client or clients. And our first client uh, that actually was demanding this function was innovation at that time, because there was a kind of old innovation like um, mobility charging, which was new for, um, uh, for energy companies at a certain stage. But like five years ago, that was a business that was started. So the question at that time was, uh, what is the new innovation, the next wave, let's say, and we developed it there. But then very quickly, uh, we came into more a position where we um, also uh, informed the board about future opportunities and risks, the board and supervisory board, and also started to interact more with uh, the strategy team. So, um, and now let's say since the last restructuring, we ended up in the uh, strategy part of the company which is a good thing because we anyway cooperated and strategy and innovation is also a joint department now with us. So, um, and now when the question is, what do we do is that we actually, of course, trying to look ahead and anticipate what's coming and make that available basically in three directions. First, uh, the management and, and board. Uh, secondly, the innovation team. So what is coming ahead and, and how could they, let's say, uh, structurally work on, on future topics and what could be search fields, strategic search fields they could address. And certainly the business in their business strategies. And more or less what we then do is on the one hand side, get the insights on what, what uh, is about to happen or is likely to happen, or at least what we need to plan with. And secondly is to get it in a structured form into these three outlets. And that is where we are. Um, yeah, very customer centric because for the three functions, the way we deliver the information all the time looks different. So it's not a one size fits all. And that's how we're trying to make foresight uh, really impactful in the company. And, and is it demand driven? Are they reaching out to you and say, OK, now we need you in this process or, or how, how does it work? It is, it is both, uh, let's say it is on the first hand side, we have a structured process where we have an annual update of most of our, let's say, core products that we're doing. And so that is something where, let's say, without asking people get the update, not on a daily or weekly basis or so, trends do not change that fast, mm. but we make sure that at least on an annual level, the board and the main functions are, let's say, that we discuss these kind of things. And then what happens all the time is, of course, if you have set up a structure and people uh, get to know you and after five years and ah, OK, there's a team who does that, then you get also the pull additionally from people that are working on, a, for example, developing the R&D roadmap for a certain department. And they say, OK, we want to take into account the future environment we're having 
okay, why not invite someone from foresight? So it started with a structural setting up of things. And now it's a mixture of, um, let's say, structural work and ad hoc questions. Okay. Okay. And Emily, maybe um, uh, uh, the same question to you, because that might be, um, I mean, it, we, our experience is that the way uh, different corporate foresight uh, functions work is, is very dependent on the origin. And, and I, I might hmm. assume that, that coming from a consumer point of view, that might be different for, for you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so how um, I would say that our more structured foresight work started about six years ago, before we were more focusing as a company on insights related to tracking our current performance. So how we are doing and setting up the objectives and the targets for the different teams. But uh, back then we started to develop more of an approach of how do we make sure that we are ready for the expectations uh, that consumers will have on us tomorrow and also the uh, the new opportunities that we could uh, seize uh, as a company and a business. Um, so we started setting up that as a and we're a global team, so we are working uh, uh, on a common way, uh, supporting all our markets. So we are present in six different countries, but I would say generally trends when it comes to like changes in consumer behavior and values that is at least for us on, only present in the nordics and the Bal baltics it's the same trends that we are see uh, affecting these uh, these countries so we have a common approach um and we always approach trends from a consumer consumer perspective uh, i would say as a company we are we are really good internally to keep track on emerging trends uh, when it comes to technology uh, that is relevant within our field. Being a telco, it's a lot of things <laughs> going on when it comes to 5G, 6G, uh, edge computing, cloud automation, VR. I mean, it's a lot of technology that is uh, uh, that will change consumer behavior. But what we are doing is really to to translate that into what does this really mean to our to our customers so how we structurally do it um, is that we have uh, one uh, recurring report that we do that we update approximately around every other year uh, i would say which is a quant study where we go out broadly and ask questions around behavior and values to see uh, how ch how our behaviors are changing. And for example, we could see uh, some shifts connected to the pandemic and how we be the trends in general accelerated when it comes to digital behavior, for example. Um, but we also, apart from that, we are doing, I would say, one to two deep dives uh, per year because usually it's good to, to focus to not to try to explain the full future of everything, uh, we, mm. we, cho we choose different areas to focus on. So that can be future of retail or future of connected enterprises or future of sustainability. So uh, we choose different topics based on the, I would say, our the agenda <laughs> for our for our company in general. Like what, what, where is our focus right now? Okay, is, the, is there a typical timeline uh, for this? Is it five years out, two years out, yeah. or? Yeah, it's always good to choose a timeline. And in general, I would say that we all often have a perspective for around five years from now, because we often want to create something that is actionable for our, for our strategy teams, our marketing, mm. branding teams, uh, innovation, and, it, and, it, and it's good to have a more here and now focus really connected closely to our business uh, but sometimes we do for example now the the report we are developing and about to launch in a few in a one or two months uh, uh, we, we we talk about both both the five-year perspective so uh, on future of connectivity for consumers but then we also have a more te a 10-year perspective and that was, becomes more of a thought starters or reflections on like where is where is really uh, consumers heading uh, and that becomes a bit more philosophic I would say yeah okay 
thanks a lot. And, and Olivier, being uh, an insurance company, you, uh, I, I assume you're looking uh, 50 years ahead. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it is true that the future is part of our of our business. So I would say on our side, I would say in an average, many of our studies are in a range from let's say 10 to 20 years. But sometimes it can it can depend, and I I can give you some some examples later. But just to give you a bit of perspective regarding uh, for site at AXA, mm -hmm. I did a bit of research for our conversation today, and as far as I know now, it seems like uh, the four site in terms of the job titles and department, uh, that is uh, when Fortnite was explicit, let's say, um, as a label, uh, it started in uh, 2014 at, uh, at AXA. Uh, and so how we are, as we are a very, also, you know, agile, uh, big company, but agile organization with a lot of reorganization, uh, the foresight function has evolved uh, during the year. So in the past, it was connected to the strategy first. So it was the main, clients, let's say, as, as Thomas just said, or the main users. Then uh, it moved to closer to, to a team that was uh, the data lab of AXA, uh, then to public affairs departments. And today it is uh, much more in connection so with, uh, with um, the sustainability department. So just to give you a bit of background, we are located in a bigger department when we have the sustainability team at the group level of AXA. Uh, the communication and the brand team. And then inside this bigger department, you have the AXA Research Fund. So it is the initiative of AXA to support science. And in this team, you have the foresight team and I adding the foresight team uh, in this bigger team with the uh, AXA Research Fund. This is, so this is just the first thing regarding our history in a way and where we are located in, in the organization. And I guess it is important because as we are exactly as Emily mentioned at the group level, we aim at working with all of our entities, business unit worldwide. So what we are doing today, our focus is really connected to understanding societal transformation, to put them into the future and to understand the, the consequences on the society and on the insurance sector and then on uh, AXA. So this is really the, the focus we have for uh, since I joined AXA now uh, in 2018. Uh, what I can, yes. No, just go ahead. Yes, yes I, no, I was just going to say that um, we, we are conducting uh, studies now in four main areas uh, in the environment, uh, in health, in socioeconomics, and in tech. And these four areas are quite relevant with uh, with our businesses uh, at AXA. Okay, yeah. Okay, interesting. Three uh, 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 different approaches to and, and different origins to to uh, foresight. And I, I know this can be a difficult uh, question, uh, but how many people are you working with foresight in, in each of your organizations, Thomas? Uh, we're working with like four people. But uh, we are embedded in a, what we call um, strategy cluster. So there are 10 more colleagues which are working on general um, strategy stuff, but also um, stuff like competitor analysis. So on specific topics, we draw from these colleagues. So, uh, but the people that, let's say, as their daily work, uh, work on foresight, that is indeed like four people. Yeah. And some people might think it's 40 or so, but it's four. But I'm interested to hear how many people these are with, with the colleagues. Yeah. What about you, uh, Olivier? <laughs> so it is, it is three on our side, you know? So yeah. you, 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 you are quite <laughs> lucky on your side, Tomato. It is three, but, but I think it is also an important dimension because, but it is also, I mean, part of the, foresight team activity, it's it, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a small team, but it just means that you are not going to work alone. I mean, this is, this is the first thing. Mm -hmm. You need to have allies in the company. And I think this is also, let's say, a foresight posture anyway, not to work alone, to mix different backgrounds. And on our side, the way we work, so of course we can benefit from, from the support of our direct colleagues from the AXA research fund or at the group level, because as much as Thomas mentioned, after five years, I guess I, in, in his role now, a lot of people come to him, but also me after four years, I have some connection inside the company that can help us. And also, 
uh, we say what we try to do, we try on our, each time we launch a new topic, we try to build a kind of foresi community of interest on that topic. For example, we worked um, two or three years in the past on, the, on mind health and well-being. And so we, we built this uh, foresight mental health community with people from Asia, with people from the UK, with people from HR department to help us to work on that topic. So a small team, but uh, that way we need to be open and to, and to work to our colleagues in a collaborative way. Yeah, yeah I, I think it proves that, that you really need to, to get uh, the organization to understand the discipline and, and to embrace the discipline, lean into it, because you don't, simply don't have the resources to do everything yourself. Or what about you, Emily? Do you have 100 people working? Yes, uh, I, uh, we, are, uh, we, we have no one who is working 100% dedicated with foresight, but we are a team covering insights today and tomorrow, and we are three and soon to be four people on a group level. Then, of course, there are a lot, like someone responsible in each, in each market as well. Uh, but uh, so I would say it's it's mainly me and one another person mainly driving the area of foresight from a consumer perspective. And since we are that few, we are quite dependent on working with partners. So we have a close uh, relationship with with research agencies who support us with uh, doing our uh, our our trend reports in general because we don't have the the manpower to do it uh, ourselves. Oh. Then we always bring in a big, a bigger team working with, uh, collaborating when we are um, making our trend reports and f forecasting. So, yeah, and I, uh, I believe we also have a question from uh, from the chat. Uh, Nabil, will you? Uh, yeah, we actually come in. two questions who are somehow related to 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 what you're touching upon here. One is skills, experience, educations, do the panelists think foresight practitioners should have? And the other one is what foresight methods do you use more regularly in your companies? system thinking, horizon scanning, scenario plannings? Uh, yeah, and then how many of your colleagues have done strategic foresight training? Yeah, uh, a few questions. Anyone up for uh, uh, an answer here? Thomas? Which was, it's always, if someone asks three questions, the question is, uh, the point is you forget the first one. What yeah. was that again? <laughs> the background, the background of the people working in Frostite, I guess, no? Uh, okay. What are the skills needed and, and so forth, according to you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think let's say it's it's two two uh, things. On, on the one hand side, um, I think it's good to bring in a diverse team. Um, because uh, to challenge yourself and get you a bit out of out of your comfort zones and discuss, uh, yeah, with with different opinions and different backgrounds. So, for example, I'm an engineer. A colleague of mine has a social um, um, a social science background. So we we come from different areas, and that turns out to be very helpful. Um, then I once once read a, a comment about what would be a super foresighter, so persons that are very good at that, and I was of course eager to to learn. And then um, it said, yeah, you should be smart, okay, but not too smart. Um, and the other thing was to be quite empathic, so to be able to think how other people could um, could feel about something, because the future is about not stuff happening, but people doing something. So you should be able to look a bit into people's head. And um, a policy background seems to be also quite useful because a lot of, especially in our energy world, a lot is also around policies and regulations. So it's also good to understand the mechanics here a bit. And I must say our team is maybe, uh, let's say, be it a co coincidence or we planned it, is reflecting that so I myself bring in the policy background from the stuff I done in in Brussels uh, on that end I said we have a social background um, background also in, in market trading and so on so and that proves to be beneficial but it also requires a form a good form of discussion because uh, if you have different backgrounds of course you will disagree and then you need to solve that uh, but we uh, see this turning out quite positive yeah, and and uh, anything you want to add, Olivier or 
Emily, to this? Yes, just to say I'm quite aligned with uh, Thomas in terms of you need to be empathic. I would say mm -hmm. humble, not arrogant, so not French, but probably, oh. probably is the best solution. But no, no, yes, and and then regarding also the yes, the background, it depends, I guess, on where what is the, the purpose of the foresight. Uh, I guess it is we what we described uh, so far. It is that foresight is a tool, so it depends on what you want to solve with this tool, and then if you want to, to really help your uh, innovation teams to build uh, their roadmap, and if you are in an environment with a lot of tech, maybe we need to have much more uh, engineer uh, people. Uh, on the other hand, I know if you are in another uh, sector where you want to be, as it was mentioned, a bit more, much more, let's say, uh, f be on the behavior of the consumer, for example, maybe you need much more social science. So there is not uh, one recipe, re but yes, the idea is to is always to 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 mix a different uh, background and and expertise. Uh, to create uh, those debates, to create the discussion. And this is from this discussion, from this debate, that you can also have some creativity. And maybe just in terms of, of foresight tools and methods that we can use on our side and in the access side, because I guess it was one of the questions. Yeah. Um, one of the, of the methods we, we are using the most today, it is scenario planning. Because it is very simple to explain, even I would say for, for non foresight people, you can build a kind of four different, four possible scenarios through a, to two matrix. So it is, a, it is a very effective tool to communicate on possible futures. Uh, so this is, the, the, this is what, what we are using uh, mostly. And actually, we, uh, we participated uh, and earlier this year with uh, Margarita from my team to the Oxford scenario program. I'm sure you know that, that methodology to be better equipped in terms of uh, foresight tools and, uh, and methodology. Okay, and Emily, is that the same tools you apply or do you have others that, that, that you has a, have a tendency to lean into? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, scenario planning is a good way how to approach and set your how to work with with, with foresight and trends. But if if you take one step back and think about what, how do you uncover trends and how do you explore? I I uh, I would also say that it's it's a lot about triangulating different sources of information because mm. uncovering it, the future is very much to understanding patterns going on in general. So it's a uh, uh, it's it's both about it's a lot about reading and doing kind of analysis of the discourse that is going around around in society in general. What what are the topics that are discussed? What are the articles written? But also read uh, papers and research, of course. But then it's uh, uh, I think it's also because you don't make sense of all of this unless you start to understand people and 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 how will how what will people do tomorrow then you need to understand how do people behave today so i would say like qualitative method is key really when it's about uncovering the future and uh, maybe approach consumers we usually focus on we, we can call them forerunners or early adopters but people who have a more mature uh, behavior when it comes to adapt to new to, to new technology for example understanding what are their drivers? Why are they using this? What is it they want to achieve? Do they want to mm. stand out? Do they want to belong? Do they want to socialize? There are a lot of, uh, do they want to feel in control? Uh, and if you understand these uh, motivations, it's a lot e easier. And also to uncover trends, I would say someone smart said, I don't remember who, uh, but like the, the future is already out there. It's ju just not even distributed yet. So, mm. I mean, it's uh it's it's just by open your eyes and 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 watch yeah. you will learn a lot of what what will be happening so i would like just make a um qualitative ethnographic open approach to to what is going on in society today and how much resources do you spend on uh, on understanding for for you as a, an entity the foresight entity on understanding what is happening and how much resources do you spend on actually having the decision makers in your organization understanding the future? Do, do you see the difference? Uh, does it make sense, my question? Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, and uh, just just to add, like I think when you talked about like what what the skills or the background, and I would say like a lot of the job working with foresight is rather about inspiring and drive like the organization. So it's it's uh, you spend a little time of like uncovering trends, and you spend ninety percent of your time to inspiring team liking to talk in, in front of people to talk about how what is it what what is this about and how can we do something about it and so i i would say that when it comes to hours spend uh, in our team uh, i would say we spend 90 uh, percent of our time uh, driving change within the organization um inspiring rather than uh, uh, uncovering trends or because as someone said they are not changing that fast oh. um, can you relate to that, Olivia and uh, and Thomas? Yes, yes. I was going to say that on on our side, I would say that uh, maybe uh, half time or fifty percent of our effort are about explaining what foresight is, how we do foresight, and why it is. And I, I guess at the end of the day, people better understand why it is useful. So it is true that, that we spend a lot of time to explain that because doing foresight in the corporate world, uh, I mean, there is really two different and com complementary uh, activities. Uh, I did not mention that uh, till now, but on our side, we so we publish, the core of our activity is to publish foresight internal studies. Generally, we publish two uh, studies a year. We also have uh, a flagship external publication. It is a foresight report, much more for our South leadership effort to show how AXA is thinking about the future, not only the future of the insurance, but beyond the future of society. But I would say the other part of our role, of our activity, is really, let's say, to educate our people, uh, to explain uh, the, the vocabulary of foresight, to try to disseminate in uh, a foresight mindset in, inside the company, uh, to make AXA a future-proof company. And what I mean by a future-proof company, it is exactly that's what you mentioned in the intro, to make sure our people are comfortable dealing, dealing with uncertainties and complexity. And uh, if I had to describe that thing two years ago, I would, like say, I would have said exactly the same thing. But now, two years after today, unfortunately, we experience that black swans are not only in foresight manual. So for that reason, it is important indeed to, to educate people uh, with tool methodology. And the luck we have, I think, in as head of foresight, it is that foresight is about a lot of creativity. We can we can use science fiction, art, design, and whatever you want, because we are talking about something that do not exist yet, the future. You are talking about something that you cannot predict, but you are talking about something you can explore, you can try to anticipate, and maybe you can work on it. So I would say yes, it is true that a lot of our efforts are on our people and on the mindset of our people internally. Okay, okay. Yeah, and um, I mean, then maybe a question for you, Thomas, because um, uh, how do you consolidate the few of the future in the organization and, and let me put some some background on this if you're working with uh, financial figures uh, you have a, a solid processes and, and and rules and routines how to consolidate the information of the past into one shared uh, financial uh, uh, overview this is how the past looks like and then you agree on the past S simply said right when you look into the future, and I mean, not one uh, employee in an organization um, or every employee in an organization have a need to look for forward. So the financial uh, area has a need for developing budgets. Uh, innovation area is, is innovating for the future needs. We have risk management looking into future risks. Uh, and, and strategy also making an overview of what, what will happen in, in the coming years. So what do you do to ensure that you have a, a shared understanding of the future? Or is it important at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, um, important question. And indeed, let's say um, we cooperate with all these different teams that you, that you mentioned. Um, because um, 
the I think a very important function of foresight is also to um, develop a kind of ecosystem with which the company can work. And part of our ecosystem, for example, is a, a trend radar that we that we have developed. It's also on our website now. We share it publicly. But there are a few products, let's say, that develop and evolve over time. And uh, we are trying to develop structure around it so that these things are not randomly popping up or so, but that if people think about the future and the more far future, like five, 10 years ahead, they can easily find us, let's say. On the other hand, we structurally work together with this team to update, for example, our trend radar and to come to certain insights. And I would say we have like 10, 15 departments um, that we work with. They are from R&D, the risk people, uh, also strategic procurement that are looking to source uh, the materials and services we need over time. Uh, but then we have a more focused, we call it um, foresight circle. It's like four or five departments. It's like R&D department. Um, it's also people from digital, uh, people from research and technology, as it's called. And with this more core group, these are people that also look into the future, but for specific parts of it. One looks at the dig future of digital in Aeon. And some others look at the R&D roadmap in energy networks or so. And in that function, it's very important for us because they look at specific parts. And then we sit together and try to make the, the full picture. And that is, on the one hand side, for us, a way to come to a joint view on it. But at the same time, these teams are, of course, also ambassadors uh, of the outcome. Uh, because they, they have developed it uh, together with us. Um, and that also um, yeah, makes it a very important tool uh, to work with these companies internally. And of course, to get their knowledge, because yeah, like was mentioned before, like whether it's three, four, five people, even if it's 20, you would never be able to grasp all the knowledge that is in a large company. So this is our way to both, let's say, get the information, but also a certain focus, I said, this core team of four or five departments, that's not 20, that's five, uh, with which we then try to distill the, the things into our core products. Okay, okay. Thanks for the, 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 the good answer here. And um, also, we have some questions from, from uh, the audience. But before that, I will just uh, speak into that we send out a questionnaire so the people signing up for this uh, webinar could give their feedback on on uh, some some um, some views of the future. We asked the question: Do you believe that your core business will undergo fundamental changes over the coming three to five years? And eighty-seven percent actually answered yes to that question. We also asked: Is your organization working structured with? foresight as a discipline, only 40% uh, answered yes to that. So only half of the organizations that, that see fundamental changes in the coming three to five years are actually working structured to cope with that change. Um, and this is not surprising because we have, answered, we have asked these questions before. So we also asked um, what are some of the biggest barriers to getting started working with the foresight discipline in your organization? And some of the answers were around, it's around corporate culture mindset. Uh, you have mentioned that, I, I believe all three of you. It's about that urgent matters trumps important matters. Uh, it's about senior executive understanding, senior executives understanding of the difference between trends and foresight. It's about the board of directors do not know or do not believe in uh, the foresight approach or that the benefits of doing structured foresights aren't clear yet. So turning to, uh, to, to you and maybe starting with you, uh, Emily, is that something you recognize uh, in, in Telia and, and how have you uh, worked yeah. with these uh, challenges? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I recognize a, a lot of the things I would say not. Uh, I think I'm lucky to have a, like a, a leadership that is uh, 
very much focused on, on customer and getting prepared uh, to, to, to for big shifts and that they're making sure that we meet the, their needs. So there is a great customer focus, I would say, in our, our organization. But then it's... Uh, it, it might be harder to prioritize, as, as I said, not, not, not having it too much of, or only having a, a here and now focus, but also to lift the, the site a bit and, 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 and look into the, to, to the horizon and maybe prioritizing also paying for the, uh, that it actually, uh, what, what we need to pay to actually do the a proper foresight work. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I would say in general, how we overcome that is to, um, uh, is, is to find a, a good hook on how we can use it already here and now. So it's both good for us because we are preparing yeah. the organization, but we also see a direct value of it here and now. Yeah. Yeah, because the interesting thing about your position uh, from what you have explained is that you also you you have to struggle with the balance yourself because you own you you also have the the, the responsibility of the insights for for, for here and now. Uh, yeah. Um, any reflections from from uh, from you, Olivia, on this? Yes. What was the exact, the precise question you want me to, to uh, yeah. answer? Uh, it, it was just the feedback of the general struggle among the, the participants of um, how to induce uh, a more uh, 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 foresight, uh, mature environment in the organizations. What, what are some of the, the barriers to, to work more structured with strategic foresight? Okay, okay, yes. No, to me, it's, it's, I, I would say that our, our raw material as foresight expert, it's all about time. So maybe just, I was just a bit surprised because in your questions, there was two parts of your question. One was on the potential uh, big shift from now to five years, and then our organization were equipped. So, but to me, an horizon from now to five years is quite, let's say, it's already in most of the organization, I would say, because in most of organization, you have at least an innovation team or R&D &R &D team. So at, and even people that are working on their um, uh, businesses, I would say they, they can have more or less a view on what is going to come, what can come from now to three to five years, because it is more or less their, their business as usual, if I exaggerated a little bit. Uh, but you think that how you can think now beyond that, how you can think about 10 to 15 years. Uh, to give you an example, we have a very uh, iconic topic now uh, with the metaverse. I think this is uh, something very interesting. And I know that you published uh, the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies, um, an excellent uh, white paper on it with different scenarios. Uh, and to me, it is exactly that, how we can think the world in 10 to 15 years. So. Uh, and so to go beyond the, the current uh, businesses. And then I will say, what are the challenges inside the organization? Generally, in big organization, when you come with a question or big question, and foresight is really use, a useful tool to ask question, people want you to come also immediately with the response. So, okay, I understand your, your, the, the issue. Now, wh what we should do now? And to me, this is what we need to, to, to manage and to deal with, with foresight. It is sometimes, it is always a tool, as I mentioned, but sometimes a tool that is going to open uh, lines of reflection rather than immediate answer. So to me, it is also uh, something where we need to educate um, our people, uh, the, also the top management, to ensure that Foresight team have the time, really, really have the time to work on a dedicated topic, uh, have the time to conduct some researches, have the time to uh, interview uh, experts, just to have the time to go beyond the buzzword and try to understand really what is at stake for the society mm -hmm. or, or for your market, for your customer, and finally, for, for your organization. Yeah, so uh, a more focus on asking the questions uh, than, than getting the, the right answers out there. Uh, uh, how does a, a, an engineer think about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, indeed, I actually would like to um, 
to challenge a bit the question when it says what's the biggest barrier to getting started uh, working with the foresight discipline because for me foresight work is um, to to remove these barriers i mean that's that's the job if the um, company already would be super forward looking uh, taking into account future developments, uh, making sure the innovation fits to this, that it's uh, in one go with the strategy and so on, then you don't need a foresight function. Um, the job starts at that moment mm. where basically, as you put in the questionnaire, everybody thinks, okay, it will be important. Of course, we need to look ahead. But all the time, the sales figures of next quarter are more pressing. And this is this this good like this because you would like to earn the money to pay people in your company to do foresight. So uh, for me, the point is, yeah, to bring this together, and that's why we um, use a lot of time to think about how we can support the individual um, teams within the company, and they need different stuff. For example, for innovation teams we work some, with something like portfolio workshops where we help them to look at their portfolio of innovation and compare with our view on the future and then you can come to these nice graphs where you say well of course you would like to end up in the upper right corner these typical strategy pictures mm. and we are maybe here or a lot in or even in the lower left corner and so in the end they can start to question or shift or move their portfolios and if it comes to to the management um, the intention is a different one uh, it's not to to move portfolios but to change opinions and that's also where we defined success in a new way uh, when i started with foresight i thought we would come up with topics where they get super excited they super sing we like it a lot but actually it's not nice to change an opinion on the future because everybody has one so it looks more like Mm. Ah, do you really think? Ah, hmm, 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 hmm. Let's see. And then if your arguments are well enough, they are not just wiped off the table. And that is why I would like to point out that this struggle in uh, bridging the, this distance between today and tomorrow, that's actually the job to be done. And in that way, should not be seen as something bad in your way or so but yeah something that is the core of of what we do in the end the the reason why you actually have a job yeah i i like that yeah. perspective <laughs> um and and maybe should we uh do we have some questions from uh, from the audience we definitely do uh, a lot of questions. Um, what are the best practices in translating rather abstract and strategic foresight into concrete product and service opportunities? So that, yeah. Yeah. So uh, a very concrete question here. Uh, do, do you have, uh, Emily, do you have uh, yeah. an answer to this? Yes, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I believe that, that that is what you need to spend most of, of your time when you're d developing, for example, a new, or what we spend most of the time when we are de developing a new product, a new, a new report, because it's not that hard, to be honest, to see what are the big shifts and trends going on mm -hmm. in society right now. The hard part is to, to explain what that means to our business and what we should do. Uh, um, based on this this knowledge, so uh, so what we do is that we bring uh, a diverse team together uh, and workshop around this. So to bring in the the business te team, the product development team, innovation team, uh, and we spend our time workshopping around what implications will this has on us and what opportunities do we see. Mm -hmm. And um, any reflections on, on that? Do you have something, Olivier, to, uh, to add to this? Yes, because I would say it is an excellent question. It is a $1 million question for Foresight, always. Yeah. Okay, now I, I, when you talk with colleagues, oh, I understood that, that you have the dream job in the company. Okay, so now what are the, the implications for our product and services? And especially because I mentioned the way we are doing foresight at AXA in my team at the corporate level, it is a very qualitative foresight, really on societal transformation. So 
of course, we, we are doing foresight and we think about the future with uh, the insurance perspective, but we are in a way a bit far from, from the product and services. Um, so it will be a lie to say, yes, we, we are conducted studies and each time we have things in terms of product and services. I mean, most of what we are producing on, in our team is about uh, to inform our top, uh, to the top management and our colleagues to inform our people. But uh, I have at least one example because I already mentioned that in 2019, we worked on the future of mind health and well-being and we published a foresight report for that. And how we started working on that topic, we worked on that topic with, as I mentioned, many of our people from Asia, from the UK, uh, mostly in health business and in the HR department because mental health, you understand, it is both an issue internally and externally. Uh, uh, for AXA. So we organized um, an event gathering a lot of people and external experts. Uh, it was uh, in, uh, in Milano, in Italy, uh, discussing with experts, with startups, uh, with, so with people really uh, bringing new solutions to the market. And now today, three years later, what I can say it is that we, it was a good way for us to help the company uh, being a bit more mature on that topic. And today we have our colleagues from the European market team still working on the mental health topic, still doing also publication, but with data on how uh, this issue uh, is perceived and is experienced by our clients in different markets, and also uh, bringing new solutions for the society and uh, and for our clients. So, so I'm not saying because I think being humble is an important person. I'm not saying because the foresight team has worked on that topic now, is there is something wonderful about that, but just we were a piece uh, in this bigger setup to help our people to raise awareness on, uh, on, on the mental health issue that also gained, unfortunately, a momentum during during the pandemic. So I guess this is also the role of, the role of foresight to shed the light on some weak signal on emerging trends and then to make sure our people are on board and are better understanding their trends. And then it can, at the end of the day, uh, feed uh, roadmap and, uh, and being very concrete in terms of uh, products and services. Okay, thank you. And and maybe um, a question then, because it, you 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 spoke into this, uh, Olivier. But a question for you, Thomas and Emily, afterwards. So, so what's an example of how you think uh, or where you think strategic foresight has really added value to your organization? Yeah, um, yeah I would say. Uh, on the one hand side, um, when we work with teams um, and look at their portfolios and, and compare this to our future view, I could mention a cooperation uh, we had uh, beginning of last year together with Future Energy Ventures. That's colleagues in our company who deal with the um, uh, where we invested in uh, startups and they have a portfolio of like 60 companies or so that we have a, have a stake in and they are trying to let's say, develop this portfolio and make sure it, it goes well together with our business and, and supports that. And uh, what we did then in a joint workshop is to, to look at this portfolio and see where does it fit the strategy in our view on the future, where uh, might it not be the case or where could there be additional search fields they haven't looked into yet. And the concrete value out of that was that it was quite at the end of the workshop, we had a, quite a clear list of, um, let's say, participations in startup we could actually challenge and some new fields we could go into. And then I think it's important to say the ones that are have been challenged, already the team before said, ah, okay, they were a bit under supervision or so, or maybe they pivoted, uh, very good for the startup, but maybe not good for us because it went away from our business. So it was not all the time that we came up with something completely new, but kind of the structural way we dealt with it made it even more clear where things need to be done. And some stuff was really like new where they uh, didn't think of it yet or so or certain part of it. And that opened like new strategic search fields they can look into. And at the same time, of course, also we learn quite a lot if there's smart people who manage 60 startups, they, there's a lot they experience. And that again helps us 
to get a better view on what is happening in the markets. And I think that is a, something which delivers value to both sides. They have support in developing their portfolio and we have additional impacts. Um, that's maybe one, one of the very tangible things. And other stuff I would like to relate what has been said, uh, like for example, uh, the topic of hydrogen, uh, we had that on our radar like four years ago. At that time, it was a lot about, okay, this is pro always too expensive and, and will probably not fly uh, anytime soon. But we had some not too bad arguments why it should. And now this happened. And of course, now, I mean, the father, uh, there are many fathers and mothers of the success, of course. But I think at least in our company, it's not that one single CEO just decides a direction or so. It is more that common ground needs to be developed. And I think in that part, putting the topic of hydrogen on the trend radar in a quite early phase made that visible and uh, an anchor to the discussion. And then it's easier by the time to, to get to speed and, and not be in the game too late. And mm. I think that is, that is stuff that is also, let's say, uh, experience is very helpful by other colleagues because we ask a lot for feedback to make sure that we're not doing uh, stuff that nobody's interested in and that's stuff that people really, uh, really value. Okay, thanks a lot. And, and time is running, so, uh, so we almost uh, spent one hour. But Emily, Emily could you give a, a, maybe a concrete example of a place where, where you think uh, strategic foresight has provided a lot of value? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would highlight our, uh, uh, a trend report that we produced last year focusing on tomorrow's uh, connected enterprises. So uh, 12 predictions around like what the, how uh, enterprises will connect their business and what op opportunities and risks that are connected to that. And, and why I'm highlighting this is like we starting off the, started that project off because we see that we have a lot of growth opportunities with connecting uh, connecting industries and companies. Uh, uh, but what we also realized it's that it's good for our it's for our innovation and how we develop our products. But we could also use it a lot here and now uh, as a conversation starter for our sales team. So, so we decided to create it and make it an external product so we can share with partners and B two B clients. And that is uh, that makes us both thought leaders, but also a great way to start to talk about how because it's a complex area uh, and a lot of companies struggle with this. And mm. then we can reach out the hand and work work together with it. Uh, so, so that was a great success. And also uh, working to, together with our communications teams, we can use the predictions in social media channels. So a lot of value here and now, but also, of course, to prepare ourselves for, for the future. Yeah, makes uh, very good sense. And um, I'm getting signals that we should have one final question here. Yes, a, a lot of very interesting questions. Some of them have been answered indirectly, uh, but this one I think is very interesting and would love to hear uh, all the participants' input on this. Would be interesting to hear, to know what are the KPIs of the Foresight team in your companies? So, so how do you measure success in the respective companies? Okay, KPIs. Let's start with the, the engineer on that one. Thomas? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have a very clear KPI and that is um, satisfaction of our clients. So we kind of, uh, the proof is at the end of the year, did we, let's say, first structurally get into interaction, not by coincidence at the coffee machine. That's also good, but really structural interactions like workshops and the like. And then how happy were the participants or how happy is the board with what we present and discuss? And if they are happy, we are happy, but we don't have a target like we need to have five predictions right or so, because we think that that won't work or will be visible only to later. It would be not too bad with that uh, indicator either, by the way, but we do it really with the happiness um, of our internal clients. So focus on the customer. I guess you do uh, like that approach, Emily, or is that, do you have a, a different approach, different KBI? 
Yeah, but I would say our, our mainly we're working a lot with uh, OKR, so objectives and key results. And I would say in general, what our main goal is to make insights uh, accessible, actionable and easy for teams to utilize them. So that is how we are following up on our work to make sure how, how broad did we reach internally um, and, and how many people can utilize the insights that we, we, we collect. Okay, and Olivier, do you have something to add? Yes, I completely yeah, share the, the qualitative ones uh, that you just uh, mentioned. We have the same here, and indeed, a good thing is um, um, how many comments do we receive? Also, um, the customer receive some comment. How many invitation uh, we receive also from other teams to present our work, to present for example, our latest publication that we did that year on the progress. Uh, and so, I guess it is very good uh, indicator of uh, of success. So it is more or less globally our whole reputation. But I guess it is a, a very interesting uh, KPI. Great. Thanks a lot to uh to to all the three of you for uh for giving such uh um yeah so so uh giving your insights uh to um to all of us it has been a, a great pleasure for me to uh to participate in this dialogue and um and also at the institute uh our discipline is to work with strategic foresight uh we do believe that in order to have the right approach to strategic foresight, you need to understand your external environment, the volatility, the uncertainty, and mix that with an understanding of your strategic approach, your business model, and understand your maturity within the discipline of strategic foresight. Now you have been given some good advice on, on how to, to um, increase the maturity on strategic foresight in your organization. Uh, we also have um, what we call a, 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 a maturity index on strategic foresight, which I believe we can send out a link to that so you can walk through the questions and understand uh, uh, how are you positioned uh, within these uh, uh, three areas. I believe that this might be the the, the topic for our coming webinar after the summer. Sometimes in August, we haven't decided exactly when this should be. But for now, I just want to say thanks for tuning in. And yet again, thanks a lot for participating and, and uh, uh, enriching us with uh, your insights on this. Um, have a great afternoon. Thank you.